Hi, this is Paul. Uh, you might hear, hi, this is Paul twice in this video. I don't usually do two videos over two days. It often happens when I get into a video and I get to a point that I don't like it, but it still sticks with me. And so I mull over it overnight and then I listen to some more of it, some of the content that I've look, been looking at on my walk and I get some new thoughts. And, and so that's where you get what you're about to get now because you'll notice I'm wearing a different shirt. I'm recording this on a different day, but I'm gonna pick up this video of uh, Balaji Srinivasan and Tim Ferriss at a different point in the conversation. I was continuing to their edits pieces of this video that I'm not going to carry through, but this, this gets into, again, I, I sort of begin this video again playing replaying some of the Verveke podcast where he uh, quite openly acknowledges that this largest frame, the religious frame, he's going to stay agnostic on and just going to continue to work on the, the, the stuff within. And that get very much gets into the dead reckoning question. And I think part of what's really interesting here is that we sort of have two sides in this emerging, this young emerging thing that's coming out on the in, on the internet. You have the the Paul King's North side and the Mary Harrington side that are deeply resistant to limits, and then you have this other side which is basically making an argument that we're always trying to better and improve. And so why don't we just continue pushing this forward? And it's Balaji Srinivasan that says a big part of the, a big thing that's stopping us is this assumption that we can fly too high. So yeah, I'm just going to have this be an introduction and then you'll see yesterday's me walk through some of this, and then I'll be back in this shirt. And for those of you who are listening to the video, sorry, um, but you'll, there'll be telltale signs of, of what I say in terms of what day that I'm recording this. Hi, this is Paul. This was the video that I posted. It would be yesterday if I, in fact, post this coming video on Friday. This was the thumbnail. A big part of this channel has always been my quest to explore in higher resolution the lines between the categories that are pretty significant for the church and to a degree significant for our culture, between Christian and non-Christian, between believer and unbeliever, um, why someone would take their time sacrifice their money, um, give their lives, their reputation, their loyalty to a church. You know, it's for that reason that, you know, books like Tom Holland's Dominion are a big deal to me because they begin to explore the underside of, of what, we, what we believe and uh, how we behave. Because for many people in the world, um, especially in this secular age, church going seems like you know perhaps just a, a rather incidental aspect of a person's life. Is it sort of like whether they bowl or go to um, have belong to a shooting club or are cat fanciers or, or something of this nature? And so, the questions that I think about that revolve around faith have a lot to do with that. And especially as, you know, for example, in this little corner of the internet, a variety of things developed that I hadn't, you know, had never really anticipated, like, a, you know, a relationship with a, an orthodox icon carver and a relationship with a non-theist professor of, from the University of Toronto of cognitive science. If you had asked me before, 2018 what cognitive science was I'd say I'll have to google it and find out so a big part of this has to do with miracles 
I want to replay this little bit from the podcast that that John Verveke participated in because I thought it it nicely and and now that we I think we have a better container I mean Lord willing John and I will meet in in Thunder Bay and I think that will strengthen our relationship and the strengthening of the relationship will produce better and healthier conversations and he's demonstrated a, a real capacity for for genuineness and openness and curiosity and exploration and and so you know it it was just fascinating to me how you know very naturally in this in this conversation here the the topic came up about you know what 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 is that what is the biggest frame where where is it where does it go like that's where my mind goes it's like oh great we're going to somewhere better i'm like where is that well, I mean, uh, there, there's uh, there, uh, there, there's two things that, uh, that I'd want to pull apart. And some people, so I, I've been up until now, I've been talking about what sci- scientists, like psychologists and cognitive scientists, neuroscientists, philosophers call meaning in life. This sense of connectedness that when any, whenever people are given a choice, do you want this sense of connectedness or not have it? They'll reliably say, I want the connectedness. I want to be you know, deeply connected to myself, to other people, and to the world. I want to be connected to things that have a meaning other than just how they're, you know, relevant to my personal preferences. This is why people have children, etc. So yeah. when I'm talking, that I, I, I feel co- confident talking about. When you're talking about this other thing, the meaning of life, like if there's some plan for you, um, I, 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 I'm at best agnostic. I don't see plans in the way the natural world unfolds. Evolution is non-teleological. Physics is non-teleological. So I suspect, and I suppose this will piss off some of the religious people who might be listening, I suspect that there isn't um, a telos in the universe. Now, maybe this will give more comfort to religious people. Nevertheless, one of the things that I think we, like I said before... So so, so one of the things that interests me there is of course the secular definition of religion becomes then that line of demarcation that that religious people have ideas and views and beliefs and and practices and um, bodies of knowledge that they claim frame um, frame in the story to the largest degree that we can we can sort of imagine I don't think wisdom is optional for us and i think we are all individually and collectively obligated to try and become as wise as we can where wise doesn't mean saying obscure profound things like in a french accent while smoking a cigarette or whatever wise means what we've been talking about it means this comprehensive capacity to overcome foolishness, to enhance flow, to reliably engender connectedness between us and the world, between us and other people. And then if you say, well, why should we do that? I don't have any answer to you other than, right, that's just what we deep, most deeply love. And where is that all going? I don't think it's going anywhere else than doing the following. Taking a biological primate and reliably through agopic love and through good presentation of ecologies of practice that cultivate wisdom and turning that primate into a person in a community of persons. And then if you ask me, why should we do that? I simply say to you, if I had to choose between a universe that had persons in it and one that doesn't, I think that one that has persons in it is a better universe. And if you ask me why, I can't give you any answer to that. And I'd wonder about anybody who had an answer for that. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess it's probably the only way that the universe can exist, <laughs> at least in you know in our individual experience, because we need to have you know the projector to create it, or we should be able to project the image in the first place. I, I wonder if you're okay. So someone sent me on Twitter this latest conversation. Actually, he referred to it on podcast, so I looked it up, and it's just recently now on YouTube. This conversation between uh, Balaji Srinivasan and he, he, this person listened to it and of course sent it to me on Twitter and said, oh, you'd be all over this and, you know, why I pick up on some things and others. I, I listened to, you know, another of a couple of his other conversations before and found them interesting. And listening to this, I had this real sense of, wow, 
are 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 the are the the conversations in my world colliding because this he would be in some way sort of the complete anti Paul King's North in these conversations. How much of the purpose of Alexa as a device in the home do you think is just developing training data and better tech so that it can be ported over to mobile use in some type of application with say AR enabled glasses? I mean, it's a really good business in its own right. I mean, we've yeah. sold tens if not hundreds of millions of those devices. So, but yeah, the training data helps, helps a lot. All three companies, you know, Apple, Google, and Amazon have, you know, these smart speaker things, which are, oh, they're kind of interesting, right? If you snapshot today and then you think back 30 years, the kinds of things that have converged, you know, the, the clock radio has. So, so he's talking about convergent devices, devices that sort of, oh, there's, there's so much game B stuff around this, devices that just sort of Everything sort of snaps into a new way when this device comes into our being and the iPhone, the smartphone, and it just suddenly via this technology, things just things just transform in a really dramatic way. Now, what's interesting about this is, of course, some would say, no, you better go back to the old flip phone because on the smartphone you have, and then people have lots of different things. It, it takes too much of my attention. It sucks me into porn. It, um, it, it, it drives my, it, it completely changes my, it changes what I am in a sense. I become sort of this, this cybernetic organism now, they haven't implanted the cell phone into my hand or put a neural link or a chip in my head, but via my eyes, the data is, is, is connecting. And of course, Elon Musk would say, well, once we can actually have a better neural link than the, the speed, which is so slow in terms of your eyes, then you have this, you know, these, 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 other, these other elements. It's become this the closest analog to that in the 1980s household for Amazon Alexa thing is that. And the phone obviously has combined lots and lots of different gadgets. And then we're going to now see, you know, if you look at like uh, the Solana crypto phone, when you walked out of your house in the 80s or 90s, you'd have your wallet and your keys, and then maybe your credit card. And then later you have your phone and it'll literally be a physical wallet and a physical key and a credit card and so on. And eventually that's all going to converge into a different kind of thing because it's amazing that your cash and your wallet and your keys to your car and your credit card can all be thought of as a private key on your phone. I suspect we're very close to that, right? I mean, you have Tesla, very which is phone tethered, and then you have, say, Apple Wallet, and then you have, you know, fill in the blank. We're, we're very close to that, I would imagine. We're close, but it's, it's one of those things, it's sort of like gathering threads, you know, so you have to gather all of the skeins together so that... Now a Tesla car can be basically opened by your phone. And then you have to sell so many Tesla cars that that's like 10% of the market and you've educated the market. And then you do it for you know your wallets or your private keys, and then you do it for your passwords and so on. And so you're gathering all of these different schemes and then you you know make that tapestry or that coil. What is that word that you're using? Skein? S K E I e even I, now I don't know if he's asking this for the sake of the audience or he really doesn't know, but this is very much a sense. What's interesting about this moment is that here is a, it's a is it a skeuomorphism? Here is an element, an artifact from the very physical world that Balaji is using as an example to communicate. And that's already an artifact that has been lost, perhaps, to Tim Ferriss. E-I-N. E-I-N. All right. New word. It's like a length. And he Googles it. Length of thread or yarn. A length of thread or a yarn. Loosely coiled and knotted. Got it. Maybe I'm mispronouncing it, but I think it's skein. skein. No, you got it. Skein. All right. Yes, you gather the skeins. Sorry to interject. Yes. So you asked for a foreseeable future. So first is transhumanism slash optimalism and i just and, and of course i would think you know part of me in in my imagine my trollish imagination would want to put paul king's north and this guy face to face and it'd be like wow i mean that that would you know the two ends you know 
just, you know, boom. <laughs> Tweet, which is uh, Super Soldier Serum is Real. Okay. <laughs> have you seen this one? I have not. <laughs> okay, so you'll like this one. All right. Super Soldier Serum is Real. Okay, this article is from PLOS. It's like 15 years old or whatever. Oh, this is like myostatin inhibitors or something. Yeah, exactly. And so on the left-hand side, wild-type mouse. On the right-hand side, myostatin null. And look at the chest on that guy, right? Like, holy moly. So that's why I put, like, the Captain America before and after. Yeah, if, if you are able to work with knockout genes and so on, you end up with uh, animals like bully whippets. So people who have seen a whippet <laughs> will envision this very, very, very thin dog that looks something like... I, I, I can't not look this up. All right, it's the it's the second one down here. Oh my goodness, because a whippet is you know this really. Oh my word. Oh my word. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely Paul King's North on this thing. Like a greyhound. But if you look up a bully whippet, you'll see something very, very different indeed. And there are also cattle breeds that are have been bred selectively, which is the slow way to do it, for this type of myostatin inhibition. So they end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger times 10, basically. Exactly. That's right. And the thing is that you know there's this movie Limitless that I really like. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like it is it changes the normal Hollywood formula at the end. See, normally many Hollywood formula, you know, move. Now, again, if we, if we introduce this into the Mary Harrington, Paul Kings North image, well, yeah. Um, and we're thinking this is a good idea, but then again, so here's the image search. You have the little pills, and then you have the dude, and then you have the cow, and yeah, I'm terrified. Movies about science fiction stuff nowadays have a sort of Icarus thing to them. He flew, he was too bold, and he flew too close to the sun, and his wings melted, and he came back to the earth, and so he should not have ever flown in the first place, you know? And, and it's basically like, you arrogant technologist, you added, but there's always some constraint and it will be subtracted from you. You'll never learn or whatever, right? This kind of intrinsic conservatism. And uh, what's awesome about, uh, it's a 10-year-old movie, so I'm spoiling it for people. But what's awesome about the end of Limitless is that he engineers away that constraint. And because in real life, guess what? All of our planes don't crash either. We managed to outdo Icarus. It wasn't like some arrogance of thinking we could fly. We could fly, right? We could figure it out. Yes, there were some crashes. We figured it out. We got it down to a, not just a science, but to an engineering. And so similarly, a lot of people, when you show stuff like this myostatin thing or whatever, they'll be like, oh, but it'll give you cancer or, you know, steroids will screw you up, man, or whatever. I'm like, that it may be the case if you are not throwing all the science and engineering in the world at it. But like, okay, so here's a kind of controversial statement. You know, Lance Armstrong, the Tour de France winner who cheated and right? Yep. Okay. Well, here's the thing. I may be getting some of the facts wrong in this, but my understanding is he had serious testicular cancer. His doctors gave him some kind of treatment. And then he did, like, he came back to win multiple Tour de France's, right? Like, he was out racing other guys, many of whom were also juiced, okay? But the point is, yes, within the game... Sure, he broke the rules, should be punished. I don't dispute any of that. From an abstract perspective, I want to know what his chemists were doing because that is some like Nobel Prize worthy stuff. To bring back somebody from testicular cancer to that level of physical fitness is insane, whatever it was that they were doing. Now, is it possible people, again, they'll come up with the Icarus line. What are you talking about? He probably dropped five years off his life. Okay, maybe he did. I actually don't know. But if he did, I think a lot of people might still take that trade-off in the trade-off space to come from testicular cancer to like 
ridiculously ultra fit and so on, but five years less of life. I don't actually think that's a necessary thing. Again, go ahead. Let me hop in here because this is this is one yeah. domain where I have I have some familiarity. So for people who want to get an idea of how doping functions at the highest levels, or the higher levels, at the highest levels you need to get uh, the actually there's a film called Icarus of all things. <laughs> oh really? No, a documentary which goes into these. Uh, I saw it. it was an interesting film. Soviet states use of doping and they kind of they kind of auger down on this so i'm going to fast forward a little bit are um, quite mind-boggling oh yeah Belgian blue is great yep <laughs> the traps on that thing are just crazy oh, the everything it doesn't even look like they should be able to walk and in some cases due to selective breeding and other types of interventions that is the case with chickens now who are bred for consumption you know they can't support their own weight on their legs past whatever it is, I'm making it up, something like week six. But I don't want to right. take us too far. We, uh, we had a Sunday after church. Sometimes a group of us from church will go out and do lunch, and we did. And Sunday afternoons, and the people who participated in this, some of them will listen, I know. Um, yeah, putting chicken flavor into chicken because we are engineering for certain qualities and like bulk and perhaps other things are getting lost there's there's uh, there's always a selection and the, these guys would say well you're just you're just you're, you're that inherent conservatism that's naysaying just telling you my reaction i'm, I'm willing to listen to more too far afield. We're going to come back to the network state. Wait, wait. I want to talk about this thing you just said, and let's come to the network state, okay? Yeah. So yeah. one thing that's kind of important about this is, and this relates to the network state thing, is, um, you know, the title of that book, Game of Shadows, and some of the words, cheat and fraud and, you know, so and so forth. The fundamental issue, and even with the Soviets and so on, right, all of this stuff is being done in the shadows. It's on the border of the system. It's by the bad guys. What it reminds me of is actually in the Soviet Union itself, there were two kinds of groups that talked about capitalism. The, the first were the dissidents, the, the guys who eventually became reformers and so on and so forth. That was a tiny, tiny, tiny minority of people. They're the people who could get outside of their childhood and all the propaganda on how evil those capitalists were. Weren't they imperialists? Weren't they pointing guns at us? Hadn't they killed our brave Soviet soldiers? Hadn't Lenin's revolution, hadn't everybody sacrificed so that you, the worker, could have this bountiful life and you're so ungrateful and evil? So that, there's that small group of academic types who could get outside their head, but there was a much larger second group of capitalists. You know what those guys were? Tell me. The black marketeers. And they lived down to every stereotype of the regime. They would cut you for some vodka. They, they were totally unregulated shadow capitalists. So are those guys team Balaji? I'm just trying to tie no, this no, together. No, 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 no. <laughs> Tying this together. My point is that when our moral premise, in the Soviet Union, the moral premise was capitalism is bad. And when, if capitalism is a crime, only criminals will be capitalists, right? Yeah. And it took enormous amount of effort over 70 years to flip that moral premise and be like, look, capitalism is at least acceptable, if not good. And then what happens is all of this stuff, you unlock the basic dispassionate gears of civil society. You have accounting and you have supply chains and you have financing. You have all this stuff that we think of as like boring corporate stuff where it comes out of the shadows into, you have courts that deal with edge cases because in the abstract, Basically, once you've denounced capitalism and pushed it into a corner, the Soviets could say, and what happens if someone cheats you, huh? Well, that's what happens under capitalism. And the answer is, yes, it does. True that scams or whatever do happen, but we have courts and we have mechanisms. And, you know, in, in the abstract, the whole thing can be denounced as obviously unworkable and so complicated. You have all these edge cases. You have the chancery court, which determines in the liquidation who gets, you know, what kind of outcome, you have you have senior debt, you have all this type of stuff, right? Meaning, sorry, I know I'm mixing a few things. Point is, you have like Delaware law and corporate law, you have liquidation preferences, you have debt senior- <laughs> Went from Belgian know. blue to Delaware corporate law in 27 seconds. I, I like it, the range. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. The point is basically that there are a lot of details when you actually come and implement capitalism. And from the outside, if you haven't done that, it makes it sound like too complicated, a Rube Goldberg machine that'll never work. Why don't we just, you know, seize everything, comrade, and, and redistribute it from the state? <laughs> and the thing that's already there is the thing that's functioning. And the thing that isn't there is the thing that seems can be attacked in a thousand ways is the system that doesn't exist. Totally. Point is, once that moral premise got flipped, once it was allowed for the bulk of 99% of people to engage in this, yeah, there's a whole machinery that comes in. And so once we can flip that moral premise. And uh, now, if you're looking at complexity, the pathway from the Soviet Union through Boris Yeltsin to Putin and I, 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 I'm not quite sure if that argument is helping him because well, Soviet Union or Russia today, I don't know, is, is, is the, um, oh, what is it? I have no idea. But it's, it's not held up as sort of a model. So well, let's, but, but his point here is once you flip that moral. We can say it comes in. And so once we can flip that moral premise and we can say, look, life extension is good and more muscle is good. And the whole Icarus narrative is wrong. The Wright brothers are right. Icarus is a myth, right? Wright brothers, that's a reality, right? We actually were able to fly. Icarus was just a mythical thing. The reality is a Boeing 747, right? Or, or whatever, Airbus, you know, name, name some recent flying aviation company that hasn't had some issues, but whatever, right? The overall, you know, planes work. So in the same way, once we flip that moral premise and say optimalism, good, enhancement, good, then we start. He, he, earlier, and he talked about transhumanism. That's a, that's a word we should get rid of. Let's call it optimalism. So, oh, there's a there's a remarketing tool. Optimalism, optimal is optimal is a good thing. So let's let's call it optimalism and not transhumanism. Okay. But shifting it out of game of shadows and Soviets and you know the doping scandals and cheat all those negative adjectives, and we start going to the positive stuff of you know, what Huberman is doing and what David Sinclair is doing and so on and so forth. I, the reason I just want to identify this, I actually think that moral language, that moral premise is everything yep. and it's often not articulated. No, I, I agree with you. And just like making the market, setting the price depth charts, we, we talked a bit about the Overton window and sort of uh, shifting that depth chart as a way of becoming political if you're an active player, so to speak. And I think... That also applies here. I just want to say a couple of things about the doping and performance. Uh, then let's let's get, uh, get totally lost into details. That the the relevance realization here is this flip him to optimalism and and then the anxiety that we have about that. And I think part of the reason we have anxiety about that is because. In a sense, this this kind of optimalism we have been flipping for has not necessarily brought us what we want. So we're going to pick up this video here because there's a there's a portion coming up where where Tim Ferriss sort of tries to dial him back and say, well, in many of these cases, it's the right dosage that gives us the optimal and. And, and Balaji basically says, no, don't talk that way because that undermines the real critical need. Well, we'll just let them do it. Another documentary, and you could learn a lot just by watching. First, I would suggest Bigger, Faster, uh, I always say. Bigger, Faster, Stronger? It's Bigger, Faster, Stronger, but I think for trademark purposes, they probably flipped it. Bigger, Stronger, Faster is a documentary that was, that was made in 2008. And it is a fascinating exploration of performance enhancement and it, it also shows the advantages that richer countries have in performance and in a sense now, now part of what i like about his argument is he is making the point that this imagined level playing field is pretty much just imagined and that we not only have enormous diversity of genetics we have diversity of opportunities um, there's just the, the playing field is just so complex 
doping and competition at the highest levels is very similar to, uh, let's call it tax optimization on the positive side, tax evasion, if you want to look at it through that lens. They will look at something like, in this documentary, use of erythropoietin, so EPO, used to increase the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood, right? which is why athletes also will use blood doping. So they might have use of EPO banned by WADA, right? So you cannot do this. It's pretty amazing that he doesn't know what a skein is, but he's got this stuff down. <sighs> Knowledge is so contextual. In the realm of sports, that's against the rules. Then you have blood doping, which at different points and in different capacities has been either allowed or not allowed. It's the same thing, right? If you train at altitude and then you develop blood that has more oxygen carrying capabilities and then you infuse yourself with that, that's kind of quadrant Two. Then you have quadrant three, which is like sleeping in an altitude simulation tent. So, and what are the axes? Sorry, I, didn't, I missed the axes. What are the, what are the uh, axes? Forget about the axes for now. It's just comparing okay. four different options. And then there are a few others. And it's just to point out that the, and again, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but the, the, you can look at four approaches to achieving the same ends with different legal status ah. or different status with respect to the rules, which doesn't automatically mean all of them should be allowed, in my opinion. But secondarily, like there are countries that do not have Olympic-sized swimming pools to train in and nonetheless have athletes who are sent to the Olympics to compete in swimming, right? Most of those athletes are going to school in North America. So I, I do think that there are, in some respects, incentives that are aligned with athletes to preserve the current state of doping because with more money with more state support you can actually game the system more effectively than not necessarily lesser players but less resourced players so i, I would just say that i don't think all athletes would want to uh, agree to nor teams nor states to say the all drug olympics if, if people haven't seen the all drug olympics skit from Saturday Night Live. They should look it up. It's actually pretty entertaining. I'm going to look it up. I doubt I can play it without Saturday Night Live throwing a fit, but I'll watch it a second. Oh, it's an oldie. That's a hilarious graphic. There, there, There's the punchline. Remember when men had hair like that? Okay, back to our regularly scheduled program. Let me poke on this a little bit because I uh, let me add one more thing. Okay, uh, then go. you can poke on this too. Please. I would also say definitely I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet, but people should muscle mass is good to a point preserving muscle mass, avoiding age related muscle atrophy. Like okay, and this is where it's interesting because, okay, now we're getting into, okay, now we, we want to, we want to counter the age of decay. We want to counter aging sarcopenia, super important, bone density, etc. But there are arguments to be made that stepping on the gas with anabolism could be contraindicated for longevity past a certain point. So I would just say there's a there's a balancing act between sort of autophagy and and a number of things we know work for longevity as it stands right now, at least in mice and and possibly in canines. And that balance is something I think people should should look at. There will mm. be a future guest on this podcast, Dr. Matt uh, Caberline. That conversation is going to get into a lot of that. Uh, but please uh, feel free to push back or, or tease apart. Just one thing. I actually, I love this. It's great. I'm learning stuff also. But I think the the framing of it in terms of athletes and the Olympic Games or drug Olympic Games and so on, the thing is, you know, as, as you're aware, in this century or in this sort of phase of humanity, we're moving away from spectator sports. And like, I, I don't really care that much about the Olympics or the NFL or something like that, but I do care about physical fitness and running and, you know, lifting and so on and so forth. So fine for somebody who wants to go and do it professionally, but I do care about the average person's health. And for the average person or, you know, any person, that's not a game. The absolute metric is what is their personal muscle mass? What is it? You know, when when a hundred people the the absolute metric. What is their uh, what is their ideal? 
what is there. I mean, that's that's what we're barking up. Let's talk about bull whippets. That's what we're. That's the tree we're barking up here. Is is an ideal? What is the ideal? And and now ideals settle down with innumerable contextualities in many respects, but all of those specific contextual ideals also work towards, in a sense, the ideal. It's it's a hierarchy. Run around a track, maybe one of them wins, but all of them, the other 99, also get a cardiovascular benefit from that, right? And that's kind of what I'm focused on is not the zero sum aspect of who wins this zero sum competition where it's like this artificial and constrained environment, but rather the non-zero sum of how do we improve people's health across the population generally, even if it is true that these guys who are like- Okay, how do we improve their health generally? And again, there, there is a sense in which maybe you can sort of ha have ha distill health into one number, I'm dubious because there, there's obviously sort of a layer of physical health, but there's relational health and emotional health, and I'd say even spiritual health. And so again, we're, you know, I, I find this terribly reductionistic. Like extreme elite competitors have something to teach us broadly, like nothing on the field really matters to anybody outside the field beyond the entertainment, unless there's some cool discoveries that come out of there and we're, we're curing testicular cancer or, or we're, we're having treatments for them that make them run around like Lance Armstrong after, after his thing. That's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Yeah. I, I think we're more on the same page than, than you might imagine. Oh yeah. Yeah. The point I'm making is that the dose makes the poison right? Paracelsus with so many things. And this includes a volume of exercise. It includes drug intake. And much like we were talking about technology and looking around corners and seeing what will be up. I mean, I mean, the drug makes, or the dosage makes the poison. I mean, that's all relevance realization. And well, just wait to hear what comes next. Obvious, or at least widespread, say five years from now, you can do that with performance enhancement in sports very easily too. You look at racehorses and then you look at say patients with wasting diseases who are using various interventions because it is their, or they view it as their means of last resort. And then you have bodybuilders and then professional athletes, and then you have rich people, right? So if you just kind of track that progression, <laughs> you can spot a lot of things super early. That's a great funnel. Yeah, you can spot, say, modafinil yes. and provisional, things like that, 10 years before it's widely widely known as a possible performance enhancer for cognition, which I would not recommend people do, by the way. It's still pretty poorly understood. Honestly, just monitoring that funnel and publishing that funnel on a quarterly basis would be one of the most important newsletters. Yeah. That would be an awesome funnel to kind of track. I put it into... The four hour body, when I wrote it in 2008, 2009, it's still reliable. You can track that stuff. It mm. does require some manual labor just because sure. competitive horse trainers aren't just going to sit down with you over a cup of tea. Now, now this, this business of an ideal is, well, this, we're going to get to this because, of course, Tim Ferriss is going to be lauding the fact that this isn't all theoretical for him. He's he's applied this to his life and in that sense sort of sets himself up as an ideal or at least someone who who is worthy of emulation. T the first time you meet and tell you all about their doping regimen right. <laughs> for a lot of understandable reasons. I agree with you on, you know, the exact dose of something more is not always better. I agree with all that. The only thing that I'm saying is just and it seems like a small thing, but it's like, I, I just don't like to even use words like doping, shadows, cheating, et cetera, et cetera, because that is conceding territory to folks that want to pathologize improvement. And that's only- Right, right. Pathologize improvement. Oh boy. The only thing I'm coming at, is it like, to sort of pull that chip, that's that limiter chip that's in our heads, you know, and, and remove that. And, and right there, it's like King's North, bang, that limiter chip. And King's North would be back there screaming, no, the, 
Pulling the limiter chip is exactly what we've done, and that's created the mess we're in. And and what Balaji here in some ways is is sort of the anti-Paul Kings North. And oh, this this image is too good. I'm going to have to capture um, because 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 there he is, shining bright in terms of the uh oh. It's, I shouldn't take screenshots um, while I'm live doing the video. Digital presence. Yeah, digital. And you're looking for people, everybody into your house. But if they oh. want to leave your house, of course you let them. Oh, I lost it. I got to go back. The thing oh. that I'm seeing is just, and it seems like a small thing, but it's like, I, I just don't like to even use words like doping, shadows, cheating, et cetera, et cetera because that is conceding territory to folks that want to pathologize improvement. And that's the only thing I'm coming at. Is it like to sort of pull that chip, that's that limiter chip that's in our heads, you know, and, and remove that chip and basically be like, actually no limits. Well, I, <laughs> so I think, I think it is important to develop an awareness of the words you use, because at least if you understand those words, they sort of form the concepts and the boundaries of your thinking. At least- No, 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 no boundaries. To the boundaries of what you deem acceptable and unacceptable, right? Nope, so you, nope, nope, no boundaries. You should be very aware of the language you use. Uh, again, I don't want to dwell too long on this. I will just say that if the opposite of pathologizing use of, just to choose one class, like anabolic androgenic steroids, if the opposite of pathologizing it is is freedom in the form of anyone taking however much they want, whenever they want, I don't think that swing to the opposite end of the pendulum is going to be a net positive for people. So, so the awareness is important. Roid me up, baby, no limits. But as is the due diligence, right? Like I have used a whole... <laughs> Falaji's like, Whole slew of these compounds post-surgically to ensure full recovery of my left shoulder, which I had completely reconstructed. And I've talked about this uh, publicly because I'm not ashamed of it. I think it was absolutely strategically, medically, the right thing to do. I'm not recommending people do that. There are both medical and legal consequences that can follow from all of these things. So speak to your GP, speak to your <laughs> They're gonna they're gonna advise limits. Position, uh, if you want to discuss this kind of thing, but uh, I I just want to make it clear that I'm not just. I just want to make it clear so I don't get sued because this is my podcast. An observer in this sphere, uh, I do think there are times and places. Well, oh no no, I, this is my this is my street cred. This is where it makes a lot of sense to use these extremely powerful molecules, but they can be misused with long-term consequences. Totally. So two things there. One is the reason that the Soviet example is actually quite good is they would also kind of jump to, oh, so you're for capitalism? Well, then everyone can auction everything at all times and everything is always, you know, prices and evil hedge funders will take your house. And the thing is that all I'm saying is let's not pathologize this. Let's not put this in a box. Let us actually think, I mean, you don't have to go to the other extreme of roid it up, whatever, whatever, you know, the thing that jumps to people's minds. There's an entire infrastructure, an entire- How, how about bully whippets and roided up cows? Continuum that can be built out when we're not just balled up in the corner of Game of Shadows and cheats and doping and 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 pathologization. That's all I'm saying. It is a great title, though. It is a great title. Just the fact that you remembered it and have said it so many times. It's a good title. You got to be. I mean, I know it's not your style of title. Oh, it's a great title. <laughs> it's like death tax. It sticks. It sticks in your head, right? It's deliberate. So that's exactly right. I mean, there's actually this amazing app, you know, that people. It came out recently, Dolly Two. Okay. Yeah. And what I love about. Have you ever heard about this? You seen this? I have I have access to Dolly too. You've access. I don't know what this is. I gotta look something else up. Dolly two is a new AI system that creates realistic images and art from descriptives in native languages. Okay. 
join wait list. I don't know about that. Explore, watch video. Let's watch the video. Have you ever seen a polar bear playing bass? Or a robot painted like a Picasso? No. Didn't think so. Dolly 2 is a new AI system from OpenAI. I, I, I don't know. That can take simple text descriptions like a koala dunking a basketball and turn them into photorealistic images that have never existed before. Dolly 2 can also realistically edit and retouch photos. Based on a simple natural language description, it can fill in or replace part of an image with AI-generated imagery that blends seamlessly with the original. It's called inpainting. In January 2021, OpenAI introduced Dolly, a system that could generate images from text, like this avocado armchair. Dolly 2 takes the technology even further with higher resolution, greater comprehension, and new capabilities, like inpainting. It can even start with an image as an input and create variations with different angles and styles. There you go, Chucky D, you're evolved. Dolly was created by training a neural network on images and their text descriptions. Through deep learning, it not only understands individual objects like koala bears and motorcycles, but learns from relationships between objects. And when you ask Dolly for an image of a koala bear riding a motorcycle, it knows how to create that or anything else with a relationship to another object or action. The Dolly research has three main outcomes. First, it can help people express themselves visually in ways they may not have been able to before. Second, an AI-generated image can tell us a lot about whether the system understands us or is just repeating what it's been taught. Third, Dolly helps humans understand how AI systems see and understand our world. Okay, well, now we know what that is. Let's go back. Great, good. Yeah. So, and there's also like open source, not open source, there's, there's more public versions that people can mess around. So the thing is, that shows the power of words more to somebody who's of a quantitative bent, more than anything I could say. Because you can write three words into Dolly 2 and get an image out from it, and it's uh, it's effectively like an extremely compact programming language. I would say like Bology improving musculature. I don't know, something like that. That would be yeah, funny. Whatever. Yeah, great, we'll see. great. Point is yeah. that if you were to actually write that out in computer code to build some of those images, it would be thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of lines of code for some of them, but you can literally do it in like three words. And you know, when people say, oh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a number, I'm a name. There's actually a, a wisdom to that because Words are like these super high dimensional vectors and you can combine them to these really complicated manipulations in just a few phrases. And what's kind of interesting is that three different technologies are all converging on the power of really, really short phrases. And those are AI, as we just talked about, you know, where you just give a few words and the computer is able to figure out all of this stuff. Yeah, Balaji's camera can't keep focus. See, this, this, this is it, this is it. Crypto, where you have 12 words or 13 or 14 words and it's a mnemonic, which stores all of your cryptocurrency, right? I mean, literally you could store like a hundred million dollars in like those, those words, you know, you could store all these possessions. Are a hundred million dollars in crypto possessions? And then obviously social media, where a few words can be a hashtag or a phrase that starts an entire movement and that is on every building and everybody quotes and, and so on and so forth. So those three points, by the way, why those three technologies, I know it's almost seems trite to say AI, crypto and social, but those three technologies are in a sense like cognitive or social technologies in a way that rocket ships and internal combustion engines are not because those don't interact with humans. These do, you know, these touch humans in different ways. Anyway, so so basically I have grown, I used to kind of think that all the word games that they played in academia in the humanities weren't that important. And it was just bore me as to why they were doing this. And now I realize it's like insanely important because a slight tonal shift in a word, that Russell conjugation thing we were talking about, you would get a totally different looking Dolly 2 image based on the tone. Sure, that's a good point. Yep. And that makes it, concrete right yeah so that makes it concrete now hmm. how about just a little king's north cleanser in sort of well maybe i can put them 
side by side in the screen. That would be fun. Here we go. Everyone else who was paying attention for the last hundred years. Um, and I'm really talking about this giant techno industrial monstrosity that is in our heads and in the world, which is really the project of modernity as far as I can see. And the project of modernity is to build a machine to replace God because we've given up on God and we're, consequently we've given up on limits and living within the natural world and our place within that. And we've decided that through the use of technology, science and reason, we can effectively build a new world which doesn't seem to limit us in any way. And we've decided that any limits at all, whether they're the limits that our body provides or the limits that the natural world provides us with or uh, the limits of even the limits of our behavior towards each other are disgraceful chains that prevent us from being free and rational and individuals. Um, and so I think it's a bit. Back to the other. <laughs> For a lot of understandable reasons. I agree with you on, you know, the exact dose of something more is not always better. I agree with all that. The only thing that I'm saying is just, and it seems like a small thing, but it's like, I, I just don't like to even use words like doping, shadows, cheating, et cetera, et cetera, because that is conceding territory to folks that want to pathologize improvement. And that's the only thing I'm coming at. Is it like, to sort of pull that chip that's that limiter chip that's in our heads, you know, and, and remove that chip and basically be like, actually no limits. Well, uh, <laughs> so I think, I think it is. Huxley and everyone else who was paying attention for the last hundred years. Um, and I'm really talking about this giant techno industrial monstrosity that is in our heads and in the world, which is really the project of modernity as far as I can see. And the project of modernity is to build a machine to replace God because we've given up on God and we Consequently, we've given up on limits and living within the natural world and our place within that. And we've decided that through the use of technology, science and reason, we can effectively build a new world which doesn't seem to limit us in any way. And we've decided that any limits at all, whether they're the limits that our body provides or the limits that the natural world provides us with or uh, the limits of even the limits of our behavior towards each other are disgraceful chains that prevent us from being free and rational and individuals. Um, and so I think it's a big, it's just a very big, very old way of seeing that is manifesting itself in, in silicon and plastic all around us. And as I say, coming at that from the perspective of an environmentalist or a former one, uh, what I saw was the green movement being entirely sucked into this way of seeing. And I became a, I became a greener years ago because I was entranced by the smallest beautiful model that the greens used to believe in in the 70s. When I was a little boy, you know, the, the world of E.F. E. Schumacher and Leopold Kaur and Gandhi and Tolstoy and, and everyone else who told us to live within natural limits in a, in a way that would actually be nourishing to us. Um, and the green movement instead bought into this machine thinking in which it saw climate change and other issues as technological problems to be solved with more technology, all of which sucks us into the same project of busting down limits. So now environmentalism has become a a question of how many wind farms you can get up and whether you should use nuclear power and GM crops to, uh, and whether you should do X, Y, and Z to effectively create a, quote, sustainable limitless machine world. Um, all paths kind of lead back to this modern way of seeing almost every question. I mean, Mary comes with this from, uh, from, from in, as far as I can see from the angle of, you know, from the feminist angle. But as she says, it's, it's the same question, actually. You can just approach it in, from all of your different sort of personal perspectives and it all leads you back to this attitude we have to nature and human nature now mark andreessen is on joe rogan and of course i can't play joe rogan videos but uh, you know so so again we started sort of with verveke's question about the giant frame and well agnostic about that giant frame and of course for me that's that's in, in a sense the fun, but but I think that those frames in fact scale all the way up and down, and so when you see let's say Balaji versus Kings North, um, you know very different frames, and then they get worked out, and of course this is this is something massively going on in our society, but you have the massive frame and then you have the small frame, and here's here's again someone sent me this little bit from from Mark Andreessen on on, on Joe Rogan about sort of religion, but then getting into, well, well how comf companies are managing these frames. 
that by offsite, offsite uh, like, like like basically conferences. fly everybody. Yeah, we'll fly everybody into a hotel or resort, you know, for three days. Maybe some of them with families. Maybe some of them just 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 with and you have people. a vacation together. Exactly right. Nice. And, and like real bonding, right? Like right. real have like, a good time have, together. Have a good time together. Have lots of free time to get. And this is of course the other three P's. This is this is the procedural. This is the perspectival. Um, you know, getting them bonded and, and those things in order to work together. Know each other, yeah. go on hikes, have long dinners, right. Right, parties, fire on the beach, like whatever it is, have people really be able to spend time together. How much of a benefit do you think there is in that? A lot. Yeah. A lot. Well, and then what you do is you kind of charge people up with the social bonding, right? And then they can then they can then go home and they can be remote for six weeks or eight weeks and, and they still feel connected and they're you know talking to everybody online mm. and then you bring them right right when they start to fray, when it, right when it starts to feel like they're in other other words, you get all their four Ps working together. Getting isolated again. You bring them all back together again. Interesting. Yeah. And the the benefit benefit of that bonding is like as a person who runs a company like how do you think of that do you think oh it makes people feel good about working there and so they are more enthusiastic about work and like how do you uh, how do you weigh that out it's to, it's to form and reinforce the cult <laughs> 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 right so it's, it's the religion of the company religion right yeah which we don't, we don't call it that but that, you know that's what it is and so it's, it's to get is to get that sense of it's that sense of community it's that sense of quite a group cohesion that like we're, we're all in this together I'm, I'm not just an individual I'm not a mercenary oh but this is gonna want to permeate somebody's life this is one gonna want to I mean when, when they go there they're gonna the, the, the resort had better have the the particular food I need either the vegan or the carnivore or, or because because can can vegans and carnivores work together I'm a member of a group we have a mission the mission is bigger than each, each of us individually and um, do you have like a little struggle oh by making the company the religion sessions where you let people air their gripes and some companies have those <laughs> we're not so hot on those we have other ways to do deal with that kind of thing um more what we're, tra we're trying to do is it's more it's brainstorming so like create creativity like there's there's definitely a role for in person um and then it's for all of the like you know it's like employee onboarding um it's for training um it's for um this, you know, planning right it's for, for for all the things where you really want people like thinking hard in a, in a group mm -hmm. do all those things but but a lot of it is just the bonding like we're, like ben and i run, run our firm like we're, we're constantly trying to take we're trying to take agenda items off the, the off the sheet uh, every time because we're trying to have people just have more time to get to know each other. How do you weed out young people that have been indoctrinated into a certain ideology and they think that these struggle sessions should be mandatory and they think that, you know, there's a certain language that they need to use and there's a way they need to communicate and there's certain expectations they have of the company to the point where they start putting demands upon their own employers. Yeah. So the big thing you do, I think, and this is what we try to do, is you basically declare what your values are, right? So you want to be, like your company, you want to be very upfront. And you, you, you state your confession. This is my confession. I've, I've looked at the world and these are my filters and these are our confession and we're going to get you all together. We're not going to call it a church retreat. We're going to call it a well, whatever we're going to call it, but it is a church retreat. We're going to get us all on the same page. We're going to get our confession down and, um, and we're going to decide if we're going to be um, woke like Amazon and others. And you want to basically say, here's what we stand for. And so we, we, we do we do this, um, in, you know, in a couple different ways. For example, you know, one of our core values um, is that we think that technology is positive for the world, right? And if you're the kind of person who wants to be a technology critic, like that's just inconsistent with our values. We don't we don't employ technology critics. Have many other places that they can work. Like Techno that. how so in, in terms of technology critic? Like what do you mean by oh, that? Oh, just like you know the kinds of people who want to go online or want to write articles or whatever about how evil all the technologists are and how evil Elon is and how evil capitalism is and mm -hmm. like all this stuff. Um, you know, there's lots of other places. There's lots of uh, yeah. I guess Paul King's North need not apply to Mark. Mm -hmm. Andreessen's tech company. You know, there's lots of other things. Counterproductive. Like, counterproductive. It's just it's inconsistent with our values. Like right. we're, we have, we're optimistic about the impact of technology on the future. Um, another is you know we have an understanding of diversity that says that people actually are going to feel included. Like they're actually going to feel like they're all they're, they're part of a of, of a mission in a group that's larger than themselves. Everyone, regardless. Yeah, regardless, and that they're not going to feel like they're different or better. Or... Because because human beings are so malleable that we can, you know, at this at this one level we can all you can all be a part of this religion. It doesn't matter what tribe you're from, doesn't matter what nation you're from, but as long as we can all say the creed together, we can be part of this religion. Or worse and that they have to prove themselves. And it's a meritocracy. Yes, yeah, meritocracy, and that they don't have to take, you know, they don't have to, we're not going to have politics in the workplace in the sense of they're not going to have to take, they're not going to be under any pressure to either express their political views or deny that they have the political views or pretend to agree with political views they don't agree with. You know, we're, we're just not going to, that's just not part of what we do. We're, we're mission driven against our mission, not all of the other missions. You could pursue all the other missions in your in your free time. Do you think the pursuing of a lot of those other missions is a distraction? And that Yeah, enormously. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it can really run away, and that, you know, that, that is a big problem in a lot of these companies now. But you can define your company, you can define your culture and basically say that's not what we're about. We're about our mission. And then you just you basically broadcast that right up front and you basically say, look, you are not going to be happy working here. And by the way, you're not going to last very long working here. Yeah. Right. If, if, you, if you have a view contrary to that. So it's confessionalism. Uh, now I'm going to go back to Rebel Wisdom's um, take, uh, Rebel Wisdom's retrospective with Zubin. 
Domania, if I'm saying his last name correctly. And 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 again, because okay, so we've got Balaji wanting to take out the limiting chip, and we've got Paul Kingsnorth shouting, You want to get rid of limits? And this is a disaster. And well, no, it's about personal transformation. And so what we have are all of these. We're, we're, we're asking questions about scale here. And, and I, think, I think part of this is born by the information age because when you lived in your little village, you knew your little village. And so I've been, again, reading, going through this trilogy of the, the Pacific War and the end of book two had this, had this big chapter about the way that the Japanese managed their media and then as they just kept telling their people, oh, the war's going great, the war's going great, the war's going great, but people are listening carefully and no, it's not going great. And then the, the beginning of book three, they had how um, the United States is managing its media and how FDR was at the beginning and now how FDR was at the end. And, you know, so so now it's, it's not that you have maybe your little tribe with your little shaman and your little but around your little campfire somewhere or you have your medieval village with your church at the center in Christendom um but but we're living in this we're living in this massive network prologue don't argue with people who buy ink by the barrel american aphorism origin unknown Franklin Delano Roosevelt's rapport with the press had deteriorated sharply since his first presidential term in office Back in those honeymoon days of 1933, the newly sworn president had disarmed reporters with a fond and familiar manner, calling them by their first names, bantering about trivialities, writing birthday notes, and inviting their entire families to White House parties. His twice weekly press think, think about how this how, how the United States has changed. It was is changed dramatically by the Civil War, Germain changed dramatically by the Depression and then the Second World War press conferences had been freewheeling and uninhibited. Filing into the Oval Office, the reporters were greeted by a cheerful, big-headed man in a well-worn, slightly rumpled suit, seated in his wheelchair behind a large mahogany desk. He was usually clutching a cigarette, and flecks of ash clung to the fabric of his sleeves. He took any question as it came, verbally and off the cuff. He kept the atmosphere light and mirthful. The president might remark that a reporter appeared hungover, for example, and ask the room for its opinion. Or he might ask the security detail to confirm that a particular reporter had been frisked. He pretended to be a teacher running a schoolroom and spoke to the journalists as if they were not especially bright grade school students. No, my dear child, you have got that all wrong. Listening to a question... Now, now for many of us who, who grew up watching TV with White House press conferences, with the White House correspondent, I mean... This could, you know, that here's FDR sitting in a room with all the people around him, treating, treating, you know, acting like a benevolent father to, to, to these beloved children. And he let his mouth drop open in a parody of deep attentiveness. His facial expressions, with vaudevillian exaggeration, conveyed amazement, bewilderment, and alarm. While considering his answer, he gazed up at the great presidential seal set in plaster in the ceiling overhead drew in a long breath, puffed up his cheeks, and expelled the air in a long blast. These antics brought forth hearty laughter from the reporters. The president did not always reply directly, or truthfully, or at all, but he tolerated follow-up questions and engaged in informal back-and-forth exchanges. White House stenographers recorded every word of his 998 press conferences, including the small talk and badinage that opened each session. The transcripts run to many thousands of pages and occupy more than four cubic feet at the FDR library in Hyde Park, New York. By 1941, the first year of his third term in office, there were still flashes of that old warmth and wit. But now, more than in years past, White House reporters saw Roosevelt as a quicksilver character, temperamental and even inscrutable, a man of unfathomable depths. In one moment, he lit up the room with his famous high wattage smile. In the next, he turned sour and snappish. It was not in FDR's nature to shout or even to raise his voice, but there was often a cantankerous undercurrent to his banter, and if he did not like a question, he was liable to give a reporter the rough side of his tongue. According to Merriman Smith, a United Press correspondent, the president could be as rough and tough as a Third Avenue blackjack artist, or he could be utterly charming, disarming, and thoroughly likable. 
It just depended on the question, who asked it, and how Mr. Roosevelt felt when he got up that morning. Calling out individual newsmen to rebut stories they had written, he pressed home his cross-examinations with the zeal of a courtroom litigator. Intolerant of euphemisms such as error or inaccuracy, FDR accused individual reporters of printing lies, or if that wasn't clear enough, plain lies or deliberate lies. The term lie characterized the motive of the perpetrator, leaving no room for the possibility that an honest mistake had been made, but that was precisely his point. Deploring the trend toward interpretive journalism, he dogmatically insisted that newspapers should have no role in news analysis or commentary, even in the editorial pages. Syndicated columnists said FDR were an unnecessary excrescence on our civilization. They trolled for gossip, buzz, 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 he called it, and passed those tidbits off as news. He labeled Drew Pearson the most widely read columnist. Now, now this is pretty amazing given the fact that you know, there was, there was so much hand-wringing and dramatics when Trump was president. How oh, horrible he, the contempt he has for the press. This is, this is horrible. Then you listen to this and this is 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. ...of the era, a chronic liar. At a press conference in February 1939, when questions implied that FDR was attempting to circumvent congressional restrictions on arms shipments to Europe, he launched into a tirade. The American people are beginning to realize that the things they have read and heard have been pure bunk. B-U-N-K, bunk. That these people are appealing to the ignorance, the prejudice, and the fears of Americans and are acting in an un-American way. Asked whether he believed the offending papers had deliberately misled their readers, FDR answered with a question of his own. What shall I say? Shall I be polite or call it by the right name? Call it by the right name, said one of the newsmen. Deliberate lie. He read four or five newspapers each morning, usually before rising from bed. Roosevelt was a pious man who rarely swore, but the morning editions often put him into a seething fury, prompting a damn, or in severe cases, a goddamn. As he read, his face darkened, his chin hardened, and his eyes glittered wrathfully. He might tear the offending story from the paper and bring it with him to the Oval Office, where he would thrust it into the hands of his press secretary, Stephen T. Early, complaining, it's a damn lie from start to finish. He became convinced that most of the American press, 85% was the proportion he often cited, was functioning as a mouthpiece for the embattled oligarchy. The Tory press, said Roosevelt, was shrewd, malevolent, and unscrupulous. It was owned and controlled by a cabal of rich conservatives who hated him personally and served up a daily diet of vitriol aimed at him, his political allies, his staff, and even his family. In the pantheon of FDR's archenemies, four newspaper moguls sat on high pedestals. William Randolph Hearst's national newspaper chain often published identical editorials denouncing Roosevelt and his policies. Media analysts correctly surmised that the invective was orchestrated by the chief himself, who wired instructions to his editorial rooms from his garish castle at San Simeon on the California coast. Robert R. Bertie McCormick, publisher of the Chicago Tribune, openly despised Roosevelt and everything he stood for and his paper, the second city's leading daily and one of the nation's most widely read newspapers, disparaged the administration without even the pretense of objectivity. McCormick's cousin, Joseph M. Patterson, was founder and owner of the New York Daily News, the nation's first tabloid. With its big photograph format and sensationalist coverage of crime, sports, and sex scandals, the Daily News prospered throughout the Depression years, and its circulation eventually overtook that of the New York Times. Patterson had once called himself a socialist and was initially sympathetic to the New Deal, but in 1940 he threw in with the isolationist movement and his paper turned sharply against FDR. Eleanor Sissy Patterson, Joseph's younger sister and Bertie McCormick's cousin, was an eccentric and profane misanthrope who bought two Washington newspapers from Hearst and merged them into one, the Washington Times-Herald. By the late 30s, the Times-Herald had won the capital's circulation battle and was one of the most profitable newspapers in the country. It was a blatantly partisan broadsheet that attacked the administration nearly every day, and sometimes several times per day in as many as four daily editions. It's so amazing that, oh, I remember life in the, when, 1960s, when, when news was impartial. Well, we're talking the 1930s and 40s here. Scurrilous anti-FDR editorials signed Sissy Patterson appeared on the front page. Newsboys hawked the paper on every downtown corner, and one or two were usually found shouting the latest headlines from the sidewalk just outside the White House gates. None of the four was a stranger to FDR. McCormick and Joseph Patterson had been his Groton schoolmates, 
and he and Eleanor had been friendly with Sissy Patterson when she was a young debutante on the cotillion social circuit. Earlier in his career, Roosevelt had counted Hearst as an ally, and had even called him a friend. His antipathy toward them, and theirs toward him, was intimate and deeply personal. Wow. Talk about an oligarchy. Since three of the four were blood relatives, and the fourth, Hearst, was linked to the others by long-standing friendships and business dealings, FDR tended to regard the Hearst-McCormick-Patterson newspapers as a united front. But in 1940, as he ran for an unprecedented third presidential term, about three-quarters of all American newspapers opposed his bid for re-election, and FDR's relationship with the press descended to its nadir. On the campaign trail, Roosevelt often went out of his way to denounce the newspapers, charging that they were failing to perform their vital role in American democracy. The press, he said, was a profit-seeking enterprise that found sensationalism and gossip more lucrative than sober, accurate reporting, and was polluting the nation's civil discourse. That fall in the New York Times, Arthur Crock cited the president's determination to preach a class war against the press, and his steady implications that the press is unreliable and often venal. After he defeated the Republican candidate Wendell Wilkie in a popular and electoral landslide, the attitudes of many newsmen, editors, radio broadcasters, and columnists hardened against the president. FDR had broken 150 years of precedent by running for and winning a third term in office. Now more than ever, journalists felt a constitutional duty to defy the powerful president and keep him in check. Looking back from the present, when his legacy has been engraved in marble, it is difficult to sense how polarizing and controversial a figure FDR was in his own time. It was taken for granted in media circles, even among journalists who liked him personally and were sympathetic to his policies, that FDR was an incorrigible trickster. He had often shown that he could manipulate or circumvent the press. He spoke directly to the American people by radio, and had done so with great success. But radio... I, I never would have seen connect, thought I'd see connections between FDR and Trump, but there they are! ...was still a fairly new medium, and many were concerned that it provided a means to weaponize political demagogy. On several occasions during the debate between isolationists and interventionists over U.S. involvement in the European war, the president implied that his critics were treasonous. The critics, in turn, worried about the inevitable expansion of presidential powers in the event that the United States joined the war against Hitler. Anyone middle-aged or older could remember the repressive censorship regime imposed during the First World War. The dignity of President Woodrow Wilson had been held inviolable, and any criticism of the president or his policies, no matter how mild or well-meaning, had been grounds to prosecute or shut down an offending newspaper. FDR had served in Wilson's administration as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, so he bore a share of responsibility for those earlier abuses. H. L. Mencken, recalling the travesties of 1917 to 1918, warned his colleagues that it was their duty, in wartime even more than in peace, to keep a wary eye on the gentlemen who operate this great nation, and only too often slip into the assumption that they own it. If the newspapers did not resist with determination, they would yield to a squeeze play that politicians have been working on them since the cradle days of the Republic. And there matters stood on December 7th, 1941. And you can read the book for that. Why play that before, you know, that was, I was going to play the pandemic video. Oh, no, here, here we are navigating. And, you know, Balaji is like, take the chip out. And Kings North is like, they're trying to abolish limits. And 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 religious people are saying, here's here's the answer. Oh, there was a I hesitate to play this very interesting video with uh, with Scott Adams today that came through yesterday that came through where he's um you know where he's talking about conservative illusions about parenting and he's got all kinds of things in it i'm only going after the logic because can i ask and, and he's just giving so many equivoc qualifications that he's like I'm, I'm about to try to transgress my audience here but here we go well, at least he's going to try and deny some of his audience capture you. Is there any conservative here who is opposed to thinking better about a topic? Nobody, right? You would only be opposed, I think, I think you would only be opposed to something that went against your most important ethical, moral standings. And we won't be doing any of that. Oh, no. None of that. Because that I respect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
So here's what I view as the conservative worldview. And this is relevant to um, teen addiction and the younger male teen... Keep it really small. I, I, want, I want to break out of my audience capture. Shooters. So that's the context, okay? We're, we're going to limit it to that context for now. And I would say the conservative says, if, if this is you, and you is just any person who might be a parent someday, you're just a, you're an adult in the world. This is you. And the conservative thought is that there are many books and organizations, and maybe you can listen to Christ, and you can get advice. And if you look for these sources, you could be part of a great two-parent situation, and that the statistics and all common sense and all experience are all compatible with the fact that that gets you good outcomes. Now, I quickly, quickly want to add a caveat, because this is the part of me that's left of Bernie. This is my opinion. This is only one way to do it. Probably the best way. Probably the best way. So will you agree with me if I say it's the best way? Now, now of course, he didn't say what sex the two parents are. I don't lose you if I say that, right? If you're a conservative, and I agree with you on the biggest point, this is the best way, statistically. But I would like you to agree with the following point, if you will. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate a little bit here. All right? So I'm going to agree with you on this, absolutely, statistically, the best way to go. I need you to agree on this. Plenty of exceptions. Right? Can, can I get you to say that? Plenty of exceptions. Here- <laughs> This, this, this massive delocation and then another video that came up this morning. So I don't deny the importance of a mother by no stretch. As I said, we're going to try to have as many. St- Just the importance of a mother to his kids. We have this notion that's rife in our culture, let's say, that's insisted upon that all families are equally are equal mm-hmm. and I understand the emphasis on that from the, let's call it the tolerance perspective, but I think that it's badly flawed in one manner, and I think this will be the hardest thing probably for us to discuss, is that you can't flatten out distinctions without a tremendous loss. You also can't flatten out distinctions part way without tremendous loss. You can't give a little bit There'll be more on this later. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's possible to dispense with the ideal of heterosexual monogamy. Now, as the ideal. Yes. So if we think, well, there's an ideal individual who's responsible and mature and far-seeing and honest, an honest trader, a good player, uh, an honorable person, an honorable, decent person. And then there's the minimal requirement for a family that's ideal, and that's something approximating heterosexual, long-term heterosexual monogamy. Something approximating? Why don't we just say that's what it is? Something approximating is too fuzzy around the edges. And maybe you have two decent people united together, and then there's a firm platform for children. Now, the problem with that as an ideal is that we all fall short of the ideal. (laughs) And so... Right. Half, 40% of people are going to get divorced. And of the people who don't get divorced, a good percentage of them are in pretty... Whole enterprise. It's either Christ or chaos. If you, if you reject Christ, you're going to have the chaos. And what Reuben and Peterson are representing is early semi-responsible stages of the chaos, as opposed to the full tilt chaos that uh, they are decrying as excesses. They're not... The conclusion of the argument is not uh, not to be described as excesses. And influences in your children's life, I mm-hmm. would just say, well, it's difficult. Might it's, be more difficult even if you're a homosexual couple, but it's difficult if you're, it's difficult it's, enough it's if tough. you're a heterosexual. And there are plenty of... So it's difficult. And the, the way this whole thing is handed to us, it's difficult. So let's legalize homosexual mirage, same-sex mirage, and make it more difficult. To differentiate. <laughs> the, dude, the dude has words. Exactly. If you say that a faithful uh, heterosexual monogamy is the ideal, a guy on his third wife has to admit that his experience is less than ideal. It's less than the ideal. 
uh, you can't say, here's the ideal and I'm doing something completely different and it's just as ideal. That, that you've just thrown out the, uh, the whole idea of ideal. Well, She's who not, isn't? And right. besides well, that's, that, that's you, the you key don't part. want to dispense yeah. with the bloody ideal just because it's difficult to attain. Right. And, and just because, because we all... We all are we are all are flawed in our own way. I mean, really, who I think you said this to me at dinner, but it's like who amongst us is walking around as the ideal partner, the ideal person, the ideal, the ideal everything, the mm -hmm. ideal father, the and ideal all of anything those. for yeah. that matter. Yeah, virtually nobody is doing that. Well, so, if they are, then the ideal isn't high enough because an ideal should be something that beckons to you from the distance, right? It's not something that's right there in front of you for you to grip. That's not right. much of an ideal. Well, we'd have a lot more people who are acting that way if it was that easy yeah, to grip, yeah. I suppose, right? Like. Yeah. There's not a lot of people doing it. Yeah. Uh, earlier at the beginning of the video, Peterson said that he wanted to resist the the urge or the impulse to flatten everything. Um, but notice what they've just done. They've just flattened sin. Um, so if everybody falls short of the ideal, now all of a sudden there's no such thing as good parents. There's no such thing as mediocre parents. There's no such thing as bad parents all, because all of us fall short of the ideal. And so, so here we are. Here we are, and, and we've got we've got Doug Wilson with a, a hard line, and we've got Scott Adams, you know, playing around here, and 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 we've got Mark Andreessen saying, "Well, you've got to you've got to get the group, and you've got to get agreement, and you've got to agree on what the business is about, and so we're not going to get caught in all the woke things, and 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 we've got you know." Um, Balassi taking the chip out and Kings North saying, no, by no means, I'd keep the chip in. The, the limits are the only thing that's going to rescue us, even though uh, how exactly are we going to stop moving towards this cliff? And, and and so all of this are, are is how we're calibrating this, this picture of the world. And, and even the even it, with all of these tendrils out, grabbing bits of pieces of informations and opinions and perspectives everywhere, and you know FDR and his war with the press, and Trump with his war with the press, and now we've got new, this new emergent media, and and you know well, well let's let's not worry about the big questions. Let's just focus on transformation. Yeah, and it's it's also. The other factor is that we have these political biases, but they're being weaponized against us by... Like you've got the colonization of inner space by the tech platforms, yeah. which is kind of the... the yeah, pull the chip out. I mean, the colonization of inner space, Balaji is... Well, that's, you know, we've, we've got to get rid, of, get rid of all those negative names and, and because the, the, this, this, this fear about losing limits is, is what's stopping us from the going out into the great frontier... The, the other part of this, which is why mm. we focus so much on it, um, Tristan Harris talked about it in The Social Dilemma a lot. Yep. And you have to realize, like, which is, again, why we have to get to the, why the answer comes back to personal growth, because our psychology. OK, personal growth, but a plant grows up or for, for the plant to grow, it, it can't just grow isn't sufficient it's got to grow in a direction it's not like the bully whip it is just musculature and it's 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 got to be part of a whole she is now being weaponized against us very sophisticatedly by these platforms that are feeding all of these biases all of these kind of negative uh patterns in ourselves of like tribalism like we we've got this yeah, I think it's be best to see it as sort of colonization or hijack, ex hijack exploiting of inner space mm. because we've done as much kind of exploiting of the outside world as we can. And now we've over the last 10, 20 years, we've been exploiting the inner space as attention. much as possible. Consciousness, attention, yeah, yeah. attention, yeah. the attention economy. Yeah. And I had a really interesting interview with Tristan Harris where he actually said, that we have to treat, we have to get back to treating attention as something sacred, mm. which was the first time I've seen him say it in such a way. But a I, I, a almost really. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I I know that. That's that's why you bring that's why you bring all your employees and your families together, and and so okay, not wokeism, but profits for us. And and FDR understood attention as you know I, he's going to go out to the the directly to the people through the radio. He's going to circumvent the the press, and he's going to he's going to get their attention. And the Japanese are. Oh, oh, pay no attention to all of those little boxes coming off the ships, and and it's, it's attention is sacred, and we're back to Peugeot land and worship, of course. Tristan has his um, kind of yeah, he's 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 I, I think he's got kind of a history with with some of these kind of practices and and sort of sees of awakening, some yeah. of the practices of awakening. Yeah. So I but think the that, dirty that's secret is a lot of these. But, but but again, awakening is it's just so. You know, I, I can awaken in horror if I learn that the, the the mole on my skin is cancerous. That's an awakening. It's not a particularly good. Well, it's an important one because you better be awakened to it if you're going to, you know, it's it's all of this stuff connects and scales all the way out. People do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, all of them do. I yeah. Think. All yeah, of ultimately. them do. Yeah. Um, and so that's the first time I've heard him make that link of awakening to so my hope, my hope, our hope, I guess, is yeah. that it gets so intense that we're forced to awaken. Yeah. Like we're feeling <laughs> so kind of exploited and manipulated and, um, yeah, attacked by these platforms that the only way is out. It makes me wonder whether... But, but, but is there an out and where is that out? I mean, in, in many ways, that's, what was his name, Alexander? Aaron Alexander. So this attention hijack is the opposite of mindfulness. Mm. It is actually mindlessness. It's saying, I'm gonna allow my attention to ride a train of thought to thought to thought that's that's actually injected by an outside agent, whether it's mm. the tech platform, whether it's these likes and dislikes, whether it's capture as an audience member by a, mm. a, a podcaster or whatever it is, and you're no longer present, you're now in this chain of thought, it's the opposite. So the question is, does that cause enough societal chaos and stress internally that, that the suffering alone causes us to wake up or is waking up necessary to actually break this mm. cycle? So it's a kind of chicken. And, and again, you know, wake up from what into what an egg scenario I, I i i think you have to come at it at both ends myself is my own intuition but it does make you wonder because why is it that my friend angelo who you know had an awakening in 94 and has talked a lot about this and he's a doctor and we've done some shows he has seen and, a and, and i would imagine these awakenings are in many ways um kind of a breaking out of NP of the of the standard menu of NPC characters into but do you then do you then awaken into another just less popular more idiosyncratic NPC I mean that's that's the that that's the frightening that's the frightening um, challenge rapid exponential increase in people who've had awakening mm. type events where they're now like, oh, I thought I was this, mm. but I'm this. And they see the world completely differently. So social media and looks is silly. That, is that generally, in his experience, is that because they've had traumatic events that have opened them up or because they've had um, blissful events that have opened them it's up? It's a mix of things. There's plenty of people who've had trauma that it's the mm. gateway, but he's noticing that even spontaneous awakenings in people mm. whose, you would look at their kind of karmic circumstances and go, it's just meh, mm. they're waking up. And he's he's he doesn't know why, but he's saying it's a real phenomenon. So mm. could it be that as you start, society starts to evolve towards integral, you're seeing this chaos, which will happen. And then that's why, you know, maybe that's part of the reason for the emergence of someone like Jordan Peterson. He spoke mm. right to the thing in us mm. that is looking for that meaning again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. So Jordan Peterson was a big part of the, the origin of Rebel Wisdom because I kind of saw him in 2017, just thought this guy is speaking to something really important and it's going to go viral, which it did. 
it, it's amazing watching the span of Jordan Peterson. I mean, I was very interested in Doug Wilson's video on this because I knew eh, Wilson wasn't going to like it. And Wilson is usually really up on Jordan Peterson. But of course, in terms of Jordan Peterson fan base, you go all the way from Doug Wilson to Rebel Wisdom. And it's like, wow, that's breadth. Looking back, and John Vivaki has talked about this as well, the with Peterson was fueled by the sense of the meaning crisis. Mm. I think a deep and the deep mythopoetics, the deep kind of religious perspective that he was bringing, or appreciation for the religious perspective that he was bringing, I think was really important. But he kept being dragged down to the political level. Like right. that was one of I think the tragedies of Peterson to is the pre-level, that, yeah. Because that's where all the attention is. That's where the heat is. That's where the kind of reaction is. And, and, and you know, this, 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 this drug that, this, this drug that attention seeking becomes because it's attention seeking. It's money seeking. It just the 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 change. Well, it's the, you know, the shorts have come in now, and in Jordan's channel, and and just the. Just the change in Jordan's channel over the last over the last week, with the inclusion of the shorts and the clips, and and I I, I have no idea what's behind it, but 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 there it is. So I I feel like he he I don't think that was beneficial to him to continue to to just go back to that that kind of. It's almost, yeah, it's, it's almost a kind of addictive thing to keep going back to that particular trough. Yeah, and you know, I'll say uh, the first time I was exposed to Peterson was through mainstream media saying this guy's some conservative mm. loony bin who hates trans people. And I and I took interest, I was like, really? And, and then I watched him speak. I may have seen a glitch in the matrix, mm. uh, your film and some other things. And I was like, this guy is pointing directly at truth. He's mm. pointing at the excesses of uh, postmodern green meme, mm. but he's coming at it. The, the fascinating, the integral, and those who don't know what integral, I mean, you can look up Ken Wilber and integral theory, but I mean, that of course is their template. I mean, Doug Wilson is, well, here's my template, you know, it's very modern, very square, lined up in there. From a clearly integral perspective, he's actually he 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 was incorporating meaning and spirituality back into mm. the evolution in a transrational way, not a pre-rational way in those early days. Mm. And I and that was a crack in reality that I saw that I was like, oh, the mainstream a glitch meaning. in the matrix. It's I might call it a glitch in the matrix if I were so inclined. Mm. That made me think, oh, the mainstream media may not have a monopoly on truth, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which I knew already, Yeah, but now I really knew it, right? This, this was something I found at the beginning of Rebel Wisdom was Peterson in particular was a real selection for people who were willing to question the mainstream narrative because they would hear about this guy, they'd go and look at him and like, this isn't who I've been, who the media is saying he is. Yeah. I feel over time he has become more and more reactive and the tragedy for me at least is that he's become more the caricature of himself, mm. certainly on Twitter. Mm. Now, I know David Fuller gets a lot of criticism from a whole variety of you for a variety of different reasons, but it takes a lot of real courage for David Fuller to basically express his um, opinion transparently because if, you know, if he if he would be sort of Jordan Peterson's favorite. I mean, he, he could, I mean, it could be, it could be rebel wisdom plus instead of daily wire plus, And that would be enormously lucrative for David Fuller. And, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for that. I mean, it's, it's that same respect that, that launched Peterson when people saw him, you know, speaking against, speaking out, speaking his mind, obviously against a tremendous, um, a tremendous weight of public opinion to 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 speak the truth. That that that's what sort of, you know, David Fuller saw that through his lens. Doug Wilson sees it through his lens, and of course, David Fuller and Doug Wilson's lenses are very far apart. But you know, I, I this is part of the reason. 
you know, I have a lot of respect for for David because saying what he says here, that costs him a lot of money. It costs him a lot of views. It costs him a lot of a lot of what what many would have him seek in this realm than that he was kind of accused of being at the beginning and i don't think he was for for quite a long time mm. but now he is kind of the the old man shouting at clouds mm. on the internet which is a real shame do you do you think it's because he was on the front lines of this sort of charge across the trenches into integral one of the front warriors doing that and he's going to go down and get knocked back until there's enough momentum Maybe. or do you think it's just a more well, complex I th I think, nuanced thing i think that under the under the spotlight of that much attention and that much he was sort of I, i've called him the one man lightning rod of the culture war mm. and trying to conduct that much electricity and i think there was a sort of slightly messianic tone to a lot of or prophetic, like I think he did see himself in the kind of tradition of, he said before, like the Old Testament prophets who come along and say your your society is out of out of whack, you're, right. you're going down the wrong the wrong path, which I think he very much was doing. Right. 12, 12, 12, 12 rules for life. Rules for life. The Ten Commandments. They're not yeah. uh, far off. Yeah. yeah two more. Um, <laughs> it's better by twenty percent. Yeah. You got Moses beat by twenty percent. Yeah, and and I think he very much had that. Like there there was a sense of him connected to something bigger than himself there was a sort of archetypal power to to his yeah the the, the arc of the peterson phenomenon and i've sort of very much covered the peterson phenomenon as being distinct from him himself right but there was this sense of the return of the repressed the return of jung jung as as this um the reality of the collective unconscious, the way it manifests through archetype, the way it manifests through story, the way it manifests through these deep embodied stories of culture coming into a into a cultural landscape that was largely formed by the kind of new atheist, mm -hmm. rationalist rejection of anything that had kind of that. spiritual or religious overtones. And that was the force of what he was bringing was you, you're, you're crazy if you're ruling out this entire kind of history of of human understanding and um, knowledge in favor of this incredibly thin rationalist enlightenment conception of reason and so he was coming with the force of all of that kind of that weight of the repressed i would say this is fascinating because you know we all go through these phases, like we recapitulate societal phases and, and vice versa. Mm. I myself went through the journey of being the Sam Harris new atheist, like loved the end of faith, was like finally someone speaking truth, had always been suspicious of organized religion, didn't understand its role in, in myself or in people in general, and just mm. thought it was a regressive uh, affectation that would uh, out, we'd out evolve as we out tribalized, you know, mm. we, we got less tribal and so on farther from the primordial ooze. And it was actually, it was fascinating. It was Sam Harris who cracked the door to meditation for me mm. because I'd had experiences where I was like, this is not consistent with atheism or, or the fact that there is, um, it's all reductionist materialism. And Sam mm. Harris's book, Waking Up, cracked that for me, but I was still quite conditioned by this atheist worldview or that, that sort of rationalist orange worldview. And, it was, so between Jonathan Haidt, who had a beef with Sam Harris back in mm. the day, and it, and a lot of it was framed by outsiders as well, you know, see Haidt is actually and saying- I, Again, I think, I can zoom in to mania, to, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. I, I think he's very much on to, I mean, this this is an amazing retrospective for many of you, and I know that. And, and, and it's, and it's, and so now we've sort of got the two poles. Of course, you've got the, the world and you've got you thing religion it has these positive merits that mm. have to do with you know uh, the elephant and unconscious stuff and I mean, Jungian kind of stuff and and things like that and then Peterson saying the same thing actually and then Harris doing a whole app about spirituality mm. suddenly you start to feel your own self for me this is just my story evolving into oh wait no <laughs> mm. there's this but there's also this 
And it then, and Peterson really pointing right at it in a way that you viscerally feel it, like you come to mm. life. It, his his lectures, I think you've said this before to mm. me or to others, his lectures are like, you know, like a journey, uh, mm. the early ones. You're just like, you're, oh, you feel an opening. It, it's almost supernatural. Supernatural mm. meaning it's not reduced to, oh, just this idea and this idea. No, there's something that happens, yeah. like a good movie or a flow state. Yeah, and, some yeah. of his former students talked about his lectures as being like a psychedelic experience. Mm. And he, even even some of his sort of strongest critics at the University of Toronto said, um, I saw an interview with one of them where the guy said, well, he was a lecturer there and said, I think I've had maybe one student in my life say that my, my lectures changed their life. Whereas something like, something ridiculous, like 25% or a third of Peterson's Students say that his lectures were life changing. It's a frame shift in perception. Yeah, frame yeah. shifting, which which you can tell when you, and he was he had the ability to, to reflect on his own thought as well in a really powerful way. Uh, um, yeah, which at the time where he was able, it's to almost say recursive. That, yeah, yeah. Where it was like this is why my lectures are having the effect that they have because people say when they listen to me that I'm saying stuff they already knew. Yeah. He's like, that's what archetypes do. That's the power of these archetypal stories uh -huh. is to arrange things that you already knew and that you can feel them go yeah. and arrange themselves within your psyche. And it's like these, these, that's the power of truth in a way is it has this sense of familiarity mm. as well as the sense of novelty. There's a sort of weird mix of novelty and, and familiarity. Yeah, absolutely. You know who had that effect was uh, Joseph Campbell. Yes. Had that effect. And if you go back and listen to Bill Moyer's thing with him, which mm. I did recently, it's like, mm. you know, it was in the eighties or something. And it's like, it's brand new. And yet it's so primal, so primitive, so connected to some deep truth. Mm. You almost feel like it's new wisdom that's just so ancient. It's a mm. very, It's a very paradoxical thing. And it, it almost forces you into a kind of um, awakening path because mm. you go, oh, the hero's journey is this. And 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 Peterson was doing the same thing. Mm. It's kind of like, you know, get the hell out of your chair, go clean up your room. Like that's just mm. the minimum necessary, necessary, but not sufficient. Yeah. And then the goal is awakening. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, yeah, why I feel. I, I, again, awakening, awakening, awakening to what? Awakening for what? Um, and, and because you know that there's very much and, and you can sit down and and pull out of them certain characteristics that they'll tend to be they'll have plenty of propositional in there but the propositional will be quite nested within the um, procedural and the participatory a sort of sense of that's what i think peterson should be doing more of is something like the the power i think it was the power of story the bill moyers I, th and, I think that was right or the power of myth or something maybe yeah, we have one yeah. or two uh mm -hmm. with joseph campbell like that's something i would love to see him peterson him do and, he, and kind of because that's what's really fueling him is that sense of the kind of and i don't think people necessarily realize like how unusual that was he was told to stop talking about young when he was in academia because he said people won't take you seriously mm. but he was obviously deeply passionate about it had he's come out recently and talked about his own psychedelic experiences which he'd hinted at in the past mm. but in the recent conversation with richard dawkins he talked about on multiple occasions having seven grams of dried mushrooms peterson massive, yeah massive heroic doses of of mushrooms that's amazing it doesn't yeah. surprise me at all we can talk mm. about that but I, it doesn't surprise me at all and what's interesting is that he had that conversation with dawkins mm. so dawkins had an amazing conversation with sam harris mm. where they talked about um meditation and psychedelics and mm. dawkins had I, I, i'm going to jump ahead past the the psychedelic stuff into the culture war 2.0 second self so we were just talking about how the we were just talking about how the first self <laughs> can be seen through as mm. a type of illusion yet has truth to it. It's an aspect of reality. It's a lens through which we experience through this experiences. But the second self is something Peter Lindbergh that you turned me on to mm. that, yeah, that, that maybe describe it for us. Yeah, so Peter has an uncanny ability to, we say he's good, got good coinage game, <laughs> which in itself is good coinage game. Yes, it is. Um, it's very I think, meta. I think he came up it's with that as well. Very meta. Oh so my God. Peter has the ability to to name and 
come up with really good frameworks for certain dynamics that really help kind of illustrate what's going on. I think he's one of the the most interesting thinkers along those lines. Mm. Um, the other framework I think that's really important for people to to get is his Mimetic Tribes. Oh, it's a crucial piece. one. Yeah, when you sent me that, it was a game changer. Yeah, yeah. like I, I genuinely believe that he wrote that in, I think, 2018. Right. And it was, he intended it as a kind of psychoactive piece because it talked about the different, he talked about Culture War 2.0 how Culture War 1.0 was basically left versus right. It was split along sort of the classic kind of lines that were established in the 50s around um, 50s and 60s around kind of abortion and um, the, the, the classic left-right dynamic. Gay marriage. Yeah. yeah. And, and how what we now have is a multipolar war mm. where some of the most intense conflicts are actually on theoretically the same side. And you, you can take look at that very easily. And, and I think go back to what I played about FDR. I think that's always true. I think it's always true. I think we're a, a little bit more aware of it, but we're, we're so short-lived. We know so little history that um, that, that, that just feels, um, yeah, I think it's always true. Easily like the, the never Trump Republicans versus the Trump Republicans or on the, the left, the kind of- Social justice um, warriors. Social justice the... warriors or around the, 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 the trans issue mm -hmm. where you've got kind of the, Turfs, supposed turfs, um, trans exclusionary, trans -exclusionary radical, radical, feminists. Fe radical feminists versus the the kind of trans rights activists. Like th this is where the most heat in the culture now is. Yeah. I think around some of these other dynamics that are not strictly left versus right. Right. And he then came up with all of these different tribes and said the, these are the active agents in the in the mimetic landscape right now. Right. And came up with, like I'm not sure how many there were at the time yeah, there were a lot yeah yeah maybe 18 or so right I've got in my mind but he he intended it to be okay so each of these tribes have a, has a specific goal they have a specific uh kind of pri kind of prime movers within it like the chieftains of the tribe they have specific fears there's there's a whole like constellation around i think i'll i think i'll leave it there so this video originally grew out of I was going to do Thursday morning when I, Thursday morning is usually when I, I, I sort of write the first draft of my sermon. And I had so much extra stuff I wanted to say about miracles than I knew I could say in the sermon. And the rest, the rough draft, which I don't know if I'll, I don't, Sunday, Rick, Rick isn't here for Sunday, so a stream might not happen. But, You'll have the rough draft, and it's a long rough draft. I don't know what I'm going to do in terms of sermon length because the sermon itself is usually 10 to 20% longer than the rough draft. By the time I get in front of a live audience and start adding things with people, I'm going to have to really be disciplined Sunday morning. But it was about miracles because mir miracles are one thing that sort of continues to point us out to the furthest reaches. So in this little corner of the internet, to a degree partly to avoid keep bumping into larger confessional religious issues, we're, we're, we're trying to keep things fairly local, say around the individual or around the little tribe. But as I said early in this video, I mean, th things naturally go all the way out to the edges. Um, you, you, in, in some ways, none of this transformation, awakening, enlightenment can be contained. It can't just be me and my little group, me and my little family. It's our, we, we have to, he has placed eternity in our hearts and, and that, that eternity in the middle of our hearts, that is eternity deep, has to be addressed. And, and I think it's it's for that reason that and, and it, even though the rough draft is I, I, I entitled at least so far today's Friday it might change by Saturday but a, a Christian primer on miracles because mi miracles aren't they, they are in many ways attention seeking but and miracles are ubiquitous in the ancient world and and that was part of justification it's part of um, the knowledge that we are limited and fearful and we are in fact going going to die. But this this point made 
by Gerd Thiessen and Annette Mertz about Jesus' miracles, I think, is, is absolutely critical, and it comes towards the end of my rough draft. Nowhere else are so many miracles reported of a single person as they are in the gospel of Jesus. This is what C.S. Lewis gets at in terms of his book, Miracles, where he says, you can, you can cut the miracles out of Islam, out of Buddhism, out of just about every other religion, and in some ways improve those religions. That's not the case in Christianity. And it's not the case in Christianity because Christianity understands that that it, it we have to, in some ways, go all the way out to the infinite. We can't sort of compartmentalize it and say, well, we'll keep our wisdom located contextually. And no, it's it's got to go all the way out because... I'll just keep reading. The uniqueness of the miracles of the historical Jesus lie in the fact that healings and exorcisms which now take place in the present are accorded an eschatological significance. In some ways, the point of the miracle is the opening, the momentary opening of the aperture to see the infinite. It's, it's the feeding of the 5,000. It's the stilling of the storm. I mean, Jesus' miracles aren't simply random. They're, they're very much pointed in a particular direction, and they definitely have a particular valence. And that valence is, is release and exorcism, release of, of, the, of the mental, of the bondaged mental, of the, of the possessed, someone who is, you know, addicted, possessed, taken over by something and and in some ways in demon possession the there's been a reciprocal narrowing of the individual to such a degree that there's another spirit which has come in and and taken over and and in order for that that other the the in order for the reciprocal broadening to happen that other spirit has to be taken out of the house but then as the parable goes the the house needs to be filled health needs to be there in order for the virus to not simply come in again and have its way. So nowhere else are there as many miracles reported of a single person as there are of the Gospels of Jesus. The uniqueness of the miracles of the historical Jesus lies in the fact that healings and exorcisms which take place in the present are accorded an eschatological significance. There's an apocalyptic nature to Jesus and the gospel, and the Apostle Paul picks up on that. Nowhere else do we find a charismatic miracle worker whose miraculous deeds are meant to be the end of an old world and the beginning of a new. And I think in some ways with the, with the rebel wisdom you know, awakening that they're looking for is they very much want that, the end of an old world and the beginning of the new, the breaking of one NPC and 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 the desire to go out into true freedom. That's what the language is about. That's what the goal is about. But that freedom can't be contained merely in my best life now. It's, it's got to be connected to eternity. Or, or it will always, at some point, reach a disappointment and a limitation that asks it a little further. Come out. You were, you, were, you were made for more than this world can contain. Nowhere else are so many miracles unique reported of a single individual as they are. This the Gospels of Jesus. The uniqueness of the miracles of the historical Jesus lies in the fact that the healings and exorcisms, so many of them are in those two categories, take place in the present, but they're afforded an eschatological significance. Ah, oh, this is a big, messy, unwieldy video. Um, I hope it isn't just chaos. I hope it has some cohesion. And I hope it blesses you in some way. Leave a comment. Let me know.